There's a whole lot of new watches on the scene, and while some are great, others just ain't. So let's take a look at a whole bunch and determine if they've got what it takes or should be thrown in a lake. And because YouTube, I've saved the absolute worst watch of the show right until the very end. Sit back, relax, and enjoy. So I'm going to go about this in a slightly different way. First we're going to rank the stuff I liked most, and then we'll go through the bits I thought sucked. Anything in between we don't have time for, so if it's not here, assume it got a shrug and a bemused look from me. So my first best watch here is one that'll catch a lot of you by surprise, because it wasn't until I saw it in person I realised how much I liked it. It's the 1908 with its icy blue dial and platinum case. In pictures it looks like a lamprey, but with additional dimensions I think it really, really works. It might have even superseded the rose gold Yachtmaster for my favourite Rolex right now. How can I even begin to justify this hate crime of a statement? I'm a sucker for traditionalism, and with the observatory hands, a favourite of legend Kari Vutalainen, and actual genuine rose engine guilloche, and not some lasered pine cones or whatever. This to me feels like the first successful attempt Rolex has made to produce a posh watch. You'll get hit really hard over the head for this one. If I could be really picky, I'd lose the super duper chronoman text above the second subdial, and it would be great if a watchmaker could at least tickle the finish of the Calibre 7140, but you'll get no such treatment with a Royal Oak at the same price, so I guess you won't hear either. In fact, speaking of the price, it's kind of almost a good deal, in the same way only having one eye gouged out is a better deal than both, because it's the same as a steel Royal Oak and half that of a platinum Patek Philippe gondola. This this is an S tier watch for me. If Rolex is the industry's beagle, a stubborn bastard who wouldn't move a millimetre to save you from a burning building, then Tudor is the lovable Labrador. Simple, full of energy and eager to please. With enough demand for coke this year to get the DEA's attention, there was a collectively sad sigh when Rolex flipped us a grey bird with the disappointing GRNR. But that was quickly followed by the ever keen Tudor with its own version of the soft drink success. Not only did Tudor slap a bezel on its GMT in the famous black and red colour scheme, it also squished it into the smaller and more popular 58 case size. And not only did it squish it into the smaller 58 case size, it even reduced the thickness so it could finally be worn by regular humans and not just people who pretend like it doesn't bother them. The watch, compared to the 15mm thick Black Bay Pro, has a profile just 12.8mm high, barely a millimetre thicker than the standard 58. It's thanks to the new calibre but MT5450U, which loses 5 hours of power reserve in a bid to lose some bulk. This is not just good news for coke fiends, but also anyone who, like me, loves the Pro but can't handle its meaty girth. Let's see how long it takes Tudor to update that. Detractors of the Black Bay 58's lack of date will also be pleased to see the inclusion here with the GMT 58, as well as a restyled dial that lets the logo get a little further away from the centre. Go look at the original 58 and you'll see what I mean. Fair warning though, because it can't be unseen. Ultimately, Tudor has proven itself yet again to be the real king of watches and wonders, and it's about to do so yet again. The GMT isn't perfect, but it is amazing. So A tier. The big surprise for me this year with Tudor was not the GMT58, although I haven't been this surprised since I forgot the car was in reverse, but the standard Black Bay, which added to the recently restyled collection with a black dial variation. Compared to the 58, the Black Bay has always been a bit of a club-footed ogre of a watch, lumpen and thick, so Tudor sought to fix that last year with some careful reprofiling. The original burgundy colour scheme was retained from the original, along with the gilt print, and that was all very nice. But this year it's gone full monochrome, and I don't know why, but it's awoken something deep down in my nethers. Putting my logical hat on, it's probably because it's just a Rolex Submariner at half price, but letting my emotions lead the way, and I don't know if it's something more. All I know is that I tried on the GMT58, thought it was cool, then tried on the new Black Bay Black and needed a little sit down. Especially on the 5 link bracelet that's definitely not a jubilee, it just wore absolutely perfect. It's the watch I wish the actual Rolex Submariner was, a bit more casual and a lot less flashy, switching ceramic for aluminium and crown guards for none. There aren't even any fake rivets to complain about. For me, this is S tier. 
I find it a little bit hard to get excited about what Patek Philippe's up to these days because, one, I've got more chance of starring alongside Tom Cruise in Mission Impossible 16 Escape from Pine View than I have of buying one, and two, because they re-release so much stuff in a slightly different colour that I just can't be bothered to figure it all out. This year, however, is exactly the same. Woo, the watch that looked like ChatGPT drew it, the 5520, is now in two-tone. I've not had this much fun since the great Christmas light untangling of 2015. But actually, actually, the mild re-editions of the Nautilus Chronograph and Aquanaut Travel Time somehow get away with it. Both are in white gold to remind you that it won't be your generation looking after it, and are complemented by a shade known on the Pantone chart as Orphanage Grey. There's a certain despair about it that really stops those kids getting any false hope. In the context of enormous wealth, however, it really works. Funny how that happens, isn't it? Like how the super wealthy and the incredibly poor both manage to be really thin, and in the case of these two watches, the casual approach only goes to make them look even more expensive. There's rubber on the Aquanaut and denim on the Nautilus, which I know, right? It shouldn't work, but it really does. Classic pair, classic colour. B tier. What's been most impressive about Grand Seiko's offerings this year is that it's resisted releasing every single watch ever all at once. And that means we can actually take a breath and enjoy what has been produced. And of course, it has introduced a new hand-wound calibre, the 9SA4, a beautiful looking movement that incorporates that famous Japanese attention to detail in every aspect. Like how when they told us that bird-shaped click was one of the most satisfying to wind ever in the world, and then handed us a watch with a dummy movement that didn't wind at all. Anyway, with that untapped excitement yet to explore, it was at least possible to see how this 80-hour calibre with the high-beat dual impulse escapement and movement side power reserve has upped the ante for Grand Seiko. And the watch it was in was nothing short of delicious, managing to capture the underside of an ice cream tub lid the first time you peel it off. Grand Seiko has always been rather talented at making pretty watches, and now with the 9SA4, this one's got the slenderness to match at bang on a centimetre. It's been launched in titanium at £10,300, which is pretty strong, although that's quickly forgotten when the price of the rose gold version is revealed at forty-five grand, like 20 more than the platinum 1908. A steel version will be along at some point, undercutting both. Lovely watch, lovely calibre, beefy price, and that makes it a B-tier. Humans are pretty dang stupid, and that's why Bulgari has spent the better part of a few years shaving 0.05mm off the previous record held by Richard Mille for its new Octo Finissimo Ultra Cosque, which is now, at 1.7mm thick, the watch most likely to get lost down the back of the couch. Why do we do dumb stuff like this? Like, for example, every time I weed the garden with a little old kitchen knife I have, I always throw it at the lawn like I'm some ninja assassin in the hopes that it'll stick in blade first. And if it doesn't, I'll try again and again until it does. And if it does, I'll do it again anyway. There's absolutely no need for a half million dollar mechanical watch that can be used to jimmy a door open. But we build it anyway because it's just really satisfying. And what's even more satisfying than doing something well is doing it better. Remember a second ago when I saved Bulgari shave that thickness down? Yeah, they literally did that, finding the extra material to be removed in the crystal itself, which was reduced from the Richard Mille by 50 microns. 50 microns. That's the same thickness as school toilet paper. That's not actually even a joke. That stuff was so thin you could read a newspaper through it. Time will tell if Bulgari are sandbagging and actually have more they can remove before working on a new concept, but for now at least they've returned as the champions of the Thin Watch Wars. Richard Mille better get the sandpaper out. Absolutely ate it. I've always stood by the fact that the Portuguesa, nay Portuguese, is one of the nicest watches in the game. You know, it's just… nice. Like when you're sat in the garden and it's warm and the neighbour kids are at camp somewhere and it's quiet and you've got a cool delicious drink and it's just… nice. It's not incredible, but sometimes nice is better than incredible. Front on, the Portuguese automatic has always been a nice watch, but like so many a misleading Tinder photo, from the side it's lacked the grace and elegance you were led to believe. To be clear, it had a dump truck even JCB can't compete with. So this year it's been reprofiled, and while they're at it, they've slipped it into a cheeky little white gold case and ice blue dial. 
Previously, the case stood at 15 millimeters tall, but now it's a very manageable 12.9 millimeters. And with a sunburst that could give SN1006 a complex, it's come together as the ultimate nice watch in this category of nice watches. And look, matching date window, so no excuses. A very strong B tier. There's been a lot of grumbling this year about the lack of advancement in the watches we've seen released, but you know what? I'm cool with it. This is an industry that spans hundreds of years, and I don't think it's really fair to expect its reinvention every loop around the sun. Sometimes all you need is a little refresh, and that's just what the overseas collection from Vacheron Constantin has got with four new models in yellow gold with green dials. I mean, Vacheron did also make literally the most complex watch ever, so I think it's fair to forgive them noodling a bit with the rest of the collection, instead of doing anything meaningful. And you can't argue with the results. Green and gold go together like Henry VIII and Syphilis. Once you catch the bug, you're not getting rid of it. I said earlier that there's nothing more satisfying than doing a good job, but to be more specific, satisfaction peaks at doing a good job with minimal effort. Sure, Vacheron could have phoned these watches in literally the day before Watches and Wonders, but you can't be mad because they look so dang good. The hardest part is choosing which one to realise I can't afford first. B tier. If H. Moser were a person, again, he'd be the kind of guy that hits the jukebox to get it playing. No matter what these guys do, it seems to be cooler and more effortless than anyone else. Are they the first to blend case and bracelet? Nope, not by a half century. But did they do it coolest? You bet. It's like they sold their soul to the ghost of Steve McQueen, because the streamliner not only sounds like the best milkshake you've ever had, it also makes the sharp angles and hard edges of a certain wooden monarch seem a bit try-hard. The same goes for the skeleton approach. Audemars Piguet's open work is cool and all, but compared to the Moser Streamliner Tourbillon skeleton, it looks like the bottom of my toolbox. The swooping lines of the streamliner skeletonized bridges look almost like the arterial system of the watch, connecting each of the vital organs to keep the thing alive. Not to mention, it's got a stonking great flying tourbillon with twin hairsprings, so no matter which way gravity is trying to get all up in it, it'll shrug it off like Shruggy Shrugs Shruggerson, international shrugging champion. This makes it, for me, A tier. It would be my favourite watch of the whole show, if it weren't for another one that Moser released literally just a week later. The Streamliner Cylindrical Tourbillon Skeleton Alpine Limited Edition. So desperate are the Alpine Formula 1 team to bring the weight down on its bloated car that they've even turned to Moser to skeletonize its watch, which comes on a blue rubber strap to further reduce mass. It gets a blue sapphire dial and of course a cylindrical hairspring, which is just the coolest thing since Lord Kelvin. S tier for sure. The watch, not Alpine. Loki, the best watch of the show, might almost go unrecognised by most, including me, until someone pointed out Jeje Lecoult had redesigned the Master Ultra Thin Perpetual Calendar. It's 39mm across, 9.2mm thin, gets 70 hours of power reserve, and has a full perpetual calendar display, including year, for just £27,300. It doesn't sound like it because that's enough to buy a BMW, but it's a bargain. No one complains that Porsche photocopy the 911 at 110% each generation, and so I think it's completely fair for Zsuzsa Lecoult to leave perfection B and do the improving behind the scenes. This is the best version yet of the most understated and elegant perpetual calendar there is, and guess what? None of us will buy one. Beat it. So that's all the good stuff, but what about the bad? Let's hit things off with the GRNR, Rolex's excuse for a new GMT Master 2. Okay, so we expect revolution from Rolex like we expect a cat to lay eggs, but this really just takes the biscuit. The grey, dry, dusty biscuit. There's a steel and gold GMT Master 2 with a grey bezel already, but that I think works. That watch plays with grey and gold through the case and bracelet and on the dial, and it all comes together nicely. On this steel one, it's like the watch was built by candlelight, by an ageing welder who never used a mask, with the half-faded grey bezel, presumably sun bleached in the window of a local convenience store, complemented by the same green accents found on the original ceramic GMT, for a design so half-arsed they should be handing them out at the fire festival. It literally looks like the original ceramic GMT with a reflection on it, and that's probably how it was conceived. 
Which reminds me actually, at the Rolex stand they had this whole history of the GMT Master thing and it was actually really interesting. They had an Apollo 13 worn watch there as well as another worn on the X-15 hypersonic rocket plane. But what made me laugh was the story of the ceramic Pepsi's colours. So with the ceramic, Rolex insists on manufacturing it in one piece, which makes the colouring process a little tricky. On combinations of colour and black it's fine, because the black goes on second and will obscure the colour. But with Pepsi, one colour is always going to blend with the other. So they ended up with a purpley red and purpley blue, so neither colour went too far into purple. But on the stand they had this colour chart and everything, comparing the colours to a faded aluminium Pepsi bezel, suggesting that the colour choices were done on purpose to match the paler colours aged with time. I mean, it's a clever retrospective solution for sure, but it did make me laugh how they were trying to own it. Anyway, eat it. Right, I'm not finished with Rolex yet, because the most heinous abomination of the show wasn't to be found at Hublot or Roger Dubuis or anyone like that, but under the watchful eye of the mighty crown. Honestly, I've not been this disgusted since I went shoe shopping with Quentin Tarantino. The deep sea sea dweller in gold is an utter monstrosity. First question, why? Second question, no really, why? This is a 44mm watch with a thickness of 17.7mm and they thought it would be a good idea to make it out of solid gold. Unless this is a new range for Olympic shot putters to get their training in, I can't conceivably think of who Rolex had in mind when they crafted this ridiculous nugget. But the gold isn't even the worst bit for me, oh no. It's the chapter ring, the Rehout. On the original it's in steel, and it makes up half of the compression seal that gives the watch its ability to go so deep. The watch itself actually seals as a column through the centre, using the weight of the water to actually squish it tighter. To match the blue dial and bezel however, instead of making it gold, Rolex has chosen blue ceramic, and in doing so, have managed to make the wish version of its own watch. If they were going for the unlicensed look, then they have achieved it. Why didn't they just choose gold? A well-earned F tier. As good as Tudor have been to us, unfortunately they don't escape the wrath of the bottom half of the tier table, because with one hand they give and the other they take away. Specifically they take away about £27,600, which if you'll recall is more than the Platinum 1908. This is the Black Bay 58 Gold, now with bracelet, and it's the most confusing release since Rose didn't share that massive floating door at the end of Titanic. Why oh why would someone with 30 grand buy a Tudor? They could pick up a Daytona tomorrow and have change enough for a steel black bay. The larger solid gold Submariner is like 6 grand or so more, which at these prices doesn't seem like a big enough difference to go for the Tudor. Especially when you consider the fact that, and it's only revealed for a split second in the video, the bracelet links on the Tudor have been hollowed out as much as possible to reduce cost. Tudor is usually a bargain, but with this one, I'm not so sure. That makes it an E-tier watch to me. You know when something looks too good to be true? It usually is. The watch that first caught my eye on the Patek Philippe stand was such a something. A 38.8mm Aquanaut in a combination of rose gold and that fetching eastern block blue that I've been eyeballing. Oh, and did I mention 8.77mm thick and with a travel time complication? For £30,280 this Aquanaut was surely going to be the hottest seller from Patek Philippe this year. And only the biggest turd in the teapot could sour it. Oh yeah, and Patek Philippe managed it by fitting the watch with the calibre E23250S FUS24H. A quartz. I don't mind quartz in some applications. It makes for some very high quality affordable Grand Seikos and Spring Drive is a genius idea. But in an Aquanaut in 2024 and with a big white ticking second hand no less, it's like they wanted me to cry. So close and yet so, so far. This isn't the Mona Lisa after all. It's just a bad tattoo of someone who looks a bit like her. I thought Rolex were the ultimate trolls with the greyed out Coke, but this out trolls them all. S tier trolling. F tier watch. Okay, get this, right? Someone very senior at Tag Heuer, in conjunction with many other senior people at Tag Heuer, decided that it would make absolute perfect sense for a watch brand whose product starts at £1,000 to release a version of the Monaco at £121,000. What is this magical fairyland timepiece to be priced some £93,000 more than the next highest price watch? It has, as will come as no surprise to anyone who's seen the watch's name, a split second, a doppel chronograph, a rotrapont. 
That's where the chronograph second hand can be separated into two for measuring laps, and is a function available on mechanical chronograph watches starting from around £10,000. For £121,000 I'd want my tag Heuer to pause and rewind time itself. We've got the same challenge here we had with the Tudor Black Bay 58 in gold. For £121,000 there's not a whole lot of watchmaking you can't get, and so to choose airport lounge and best man gift favourite tag Hoyer, you'd have to be a certain flavour of mental. I've seen some people saying they think it's great, and to them I'd say, go on then, you go hand tag Hoyer £121,000 instead of giving it to Patek Philippe and walking away with the chronograph and an annual calendar. No, F tier for lunacy. I won't dwell too long on what I think is the worst watch of the whole ensemble because the brand's efforts are otherwise admirable. I'd like to chalk this up to a momentary lapse of reason because whilst this is abysmal, the otherwise excellent Alpine Eagle is one of the best value high-end luxury sports watches in the game. In skeleton form, not so much, and I hesitate to even call it that. For the Alpine Eagle 41 XPTT, Chopin has, how can I put this, taken what could have been a very nice watch and made it very, very bad. I haven't seen an effort this poor since Mount Etna tried to quit smoking. There's phoning it in, and then there's sending it via carrier pigeon. Where a skeletonized watch uses creativity and artisanship to remove material from a movement to reveal the secrets of the mechanism within, the Chopard XPTT looks like it should strain your pasta. It doesn't look all that great, but I'm sure it'd do a fantastic job of stopping hair getting down the plug hole. I can only imagine this thing was made on baby's first CNC machine. It's a shame, because if anyone can do a great job of it, it's Chopard, and I do see that they've tried to do it within a very reasonable price point. But unfortunately, if the Moser we saw earlier is the watch the Royal Oak Openworked wishes it could be, this is the one we have at home. Sorry Chopard, F tier. That wraps it up for another Watches and Wonders, and we've had a blast. Tell me what your best and worst watches this year were down in the comments, and whilst you're there, why not join these lovely people via the Patreon link in the description. And remember, you can be as mean as you like to people on the internet, because they aren't even real. See you next time.